For God's sake, welcome to the 75th and final episode of this podcast. Uh, it can now be revealed that the first 74 episodes were all just a clever ruse to lure Hugh Howie to the show. Uh, and now that he's here, I can drop the charade. <laughs> we don't have to do any more episodes. Now, teasing, of course. Uh, we've got three more uh, lined up and ready to go. I'm also very excited about uh, and I try not to show favoritism to authors because it's it's a bad policy. But you know I love your stuff. I make references to you uh, on a regular basis. Uh, you are the only author who's ever been interviewed twice at middlegradeninja.com. Uh, you've asked, you asked the original seven questions. Then I wrote seven more just for you. Uh, and I still can't believe my good fortune that not only are those interviews available now at middlegradeninja.com, uh, but now that we're, we're having this conversation, my cup runneth over. Uh, we're stuck here in quarantine for COVID-19, and I just had this to look forward to all week, and it's just been a huge lift. And I, I thank you, Hugh, for making the time and for, for being here tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure, Rob, and congrats on 75 episodes. I, um, I'm a little disappointed you didn't save me for the 100th, but I... I uh, Congratulations to whoever gets that uh, that spot. Oh, no, 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 it was a random tweet. You are welcome back for a number 100, but you said, <laughs> no, yes, I oh, take my it. God, yeah, well, the just... iron's hot, let's do it. But I would have been on your first episode. I would have saved you all this trouble if, uh, if I'd have known. This is too much. You've been doing this for a long time, and, man, I'm just happy to be here. No, that's, uh, well, you know what? The, the other 74 conversations, they, they were pretty darn interesting also. <laughs> so it's win-win. Uh, so usually where I ask people, uh, our guest to start is the worst thing in the world would be to make you sit through me explaining your biography uh, or one of your books. Uh, so if you would just kind of give esteemed audience a little bit of an overview, if there's anybody who's interested in publishing, they probably already know a little bit about who you are, but for the uninitiated, uh, tell them, tell them who you are, Hugh Howie. Um, man, I, I still feel like a uh, like kid who grew up on a farm in North Carolina and like loves to read it. Uh, all the things that have happened in the last 10 years or so just really don't compute. But I uh, bounced, bounced around a lot when I was younger and worked a lot of odd jobs and lived on sailboats and um, dropped out of college, uh, sailed around the islands for about a year and then started working on yachts and did that for about a decade. And um, I dreamt about writing a novel my whole life. For about 20 years, I would write like two chapters of a book and give up and get disinterested and move on to something else. And um, I think I was like 30, 32 when I wrote my first uh, novel and realized, oh, my God, I can actually do this and finish a book and um, did not stop writing for, you know, the next uh, six or seven years. I was writing two or three novels a year. And it was my seventh uh, published work that really allowed me to quit my day job, um, the short story called Wool that uh, was just on sale for 99 cents on Amazon. And is that that one thing that went viral you know and and since then a lot of my other stuff has done well and i've been just really like i was in the right place at the right time and really fortunate to um uh have had a bunch of self-publishing tools come online when i was writing and and kind of um didn't have big ambitions for my writing career so i didn't go after big publishing deals instead i thought i would just do it myself and it ended up being a, a great decision and uh, yeah, about, um, I guess the only other thing to add is about five years ago, I jumped on a, a sailboat in South Africa and started um, doing the sailing. I've always dreamed about doing sailing across the Atlantic and the Pacific and visiting some really, really remote parts of the world. And um, now I'm in New York and here to do some more writing and work on some Hollywood stuff that maybe we can drop hints about today. And uh, probably spend a couple of years um, um, getting some stuff done in the States before I take off uh, for some more sailing. So that's it. I just feel like a dumb, lucky kid who's like getting to do the two things he's always dreamed about his whole life, you know, write books and and sail across the horizon. We, uh, there's a couple of things that I, I want to make sure we go back and, 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 and break down just a, a little bit. But question that comes to mind immediately here we are in the middle of uh, quarantine for COVID-19 this seems like the ideal time to hop on a sailboat and, and get out as far away from the land as possible come back once uh, once we're all zombies but the rest of us are healthy and <laughs> yeah you know you would think that but um, the uh, all my friends who are on boats are having a really hard time um, you either have very limited shore access so you're kind of just stuck on the boat at anchor which doesn't sound terrible but you can get pretty stir crazy or countries are limiting 
um, who can come in and clear out and, and you can't just choose where you're going to sail next. Um, I, one way to think about it is when you live on a sailboat, you're kind of living on the fringe of civilization already. Like it's a pretty tenuous situation and the only way it's uh, enjoyable and viable is that you have um, civilization to dip into, to get supplies, to um, you know, go ashore and see things, to order spares. And when society is, you know, that, that bedrock that you rely on, when civilization starts to crumble a little bit, living on the edge is no longer uh, as comforting as you would think. Um, honestly, there's no place I'd rather be than New York. And I know that sounds crazy when you look at what we've had happen here in the numbers, but like, you know, we've taken all the precautions, we wear masks and wash our hands and are quarantining and not, you know, socializing with, with friends except, you know, uh, a park bench away, um, keeping our distance when we go for walks with friends. But we go to the grocery store and it's just full of food. We can order any kind of cuisine we want delivered to us. Uh, um, New York is very quiet right now. There's no traffic. It's The birds are out. The air feels fresher. It's uh, one of, you know, nothing can stop. If I was on a boat in the South Pacific, the people here would still be suffering and people would still be losing their jobs and bad things would be happening. So no, nowhere you can be in the world, you're going to prevent things from, from taking place like they are. But um, I, I feel very secure here and very lucky and we, we aren't hurting for anything. And this, this city is so robust and so full of amazing people. I, I happen to be here on uh, 9-11. I was actually at the base of the World Trade Center when all that went down. And the way the city responded uh, and then the way the country and the world responded around us was just inspiring to me. And I feel the same way. Um, you just missed it because it's eight o'clock here, but it's seven o'clock. We bang pots and pans and everybody goes out in their balconies and we really celebrate the people who are working so hard to keep everything moving. So I, I have not been sad to be here at all. I was actually in Portugal when things started getting really crazy and we flew back to be home for this. And uh, I'm glad we did. Been super happy here. As you're here, I mean, you know, the nice thing about talking to writers is has your life changed that dramatically by being quarantined? Has my life changed? Um, I don't know. My life has been so strange that this, you know, humans adapt so quickly. I feel like this is just like another another chapter in a really weird life. Like living on a boat is is really wild. Like every every month or so I'd be living in a different country and around different languages. And you start to feel like uh um, you know, my very first series of books was about this uh, teenage girl, you know, flying from planet to planet on her ship with her friends. And it really felt like like that. Like we would stop in um, really remote islands, people that do, a lot of people have never left the islands, um, went to St. Helena where Napoleon was interred and met people who were in their 80s there who never left that island because it's so far from anywhere. Um went to a place called Palmerston Island, which is between the Cook Islands and French Polynesia. And it was founded by a man and three wives like forever ago. And there's still three villages on this island all within hundreds of yards of each other. And those three villages are like, um, have grown out of those three women and their, their children. And you have to marry within the village. And it's just the most unique and wild place you've ever even dreamed about. And um, you know, lived with those people for for a while, and and uh, I have to say, like, you, you kind of get used to how bizarre the world is, and this just feels like another another situation like that. So, um, of course, it's changed our daily routine, but it doesn't make me feel like a different person at all. It uh, you just kind of you know accept it and get used to it and make the best of it. And I, I always try to see the silver lining and everything. You know, we're um, cooking a lot and, you know, reading and enjoying, um, enjoying my relationship with my girlfriend and, um, uh, yeah, I playing board games online with tabletop simulator, something I didn't even know existed. And it's actually really fun. So I've been playing games with people I don't get to see very often in Texas and California. So I, there's blessings in everything, you know? So you're playing like uh, Monopoly or a little, a little more advanced than that? Monopoly is like, <laughs> I could go on a rant about Monopoly. It's like one of the worst board games ever made, and it's wild that it's like <laughs> one board game everyone has to own. But um, I, I don't like board games where like someone can be can be knocked out of the game 
early and then have to just sit there and watch and the game goes on too long and it's uh uh yeah I, there's so many great board games out there and that's not one of them but um yeah like Catan and carcassonne and azul and wingspan and gloomhaven um i know it sounds like gibberish to a non-board gamer but ah, i know Catan. I yeah, this Catan. oh Catan's classic but this is like the golden age of board gaming and tabletop simulator is a great way to it actually doesn't feel like you're playing a computer game. It feels like you're actually playing a board game with your friends. 